is really rapid. It's not just economic but demographic. The waves and waves of fortune seekers, so to say, coming to Bangalore. In fact, Bangalore, I think, has been the fastest growing city in Asia for the last 10 or 15 years. It's not really going to continue, it's going to grow because from what we can see, we got the manpower, we got the brains, we got the education now, we have good quality education. Even if a person is not privileged, he has the advantage of uh, being in a city which is technology advanced, something may rub off on him. He may see some kid, uh, his classmate, he may be a poor kid, but his classmate be having some computer. He may go to his house and he may learn something. Nobody has any strong base, nobody has uh, any reason why we are doing this. Other than just talking about that, we, well, we are earning good money now, we have enough money. So in a way, like, it doesn't bring any kind of a social responsibility. It's like, you know, I'm fine because like, I'm, uh, I can speak with the accent, then I, I speak English, and I get paid well. I spend a lot of my time outside of Infosys actually focusing on civic and community issues. It's like, I think it's getting to be a good blend of the West and the East. You know, the values of the East, the family values, they are still strong here. At the same time, uh, the career, you know, people concentrating on their career, I mean girls also concentrating more on their career than on marriage and things, that's also happening. An overkill and an excess of the kind of architecture that's happening in the city, the kind of mindless kind of architecture with glass facades that don't fit into the kind of space and time of, of the city. It's really easy to make money now. Like for example, uh, there's this, this shop called Westside and I'm telling stories there. And I get 15,000 rupees for working five weekends, which is a lot. And like to tell you how much it is, a person who studied engineering would probably get that much in a month. But if you ask me why I like Bangalore, it's the most tolerant place for a minority community like me. I'm a Christian. So me and a couple of friends, we just started off this small business. and. My dad is not a businessman, neither is anybody in our family, you know. Business is generally looked down upon in India, you know. <laughs> if you say you're an entrepreneur, it's more like, you know, what if you fail? In recent years, at least the last 200 years, among the first people it attracted were the British. So Bangalore became a center of British colonial rule in South India. And with the British came Tamils, Telugus, uh, North Indians to help and service the colonial. Uh, this was the cantonment city, to so help and service the British. After Indian independence, Bangalore was the capital of Karnataka. But it already had a cosmo cosmopolitan character. Karnataka uh, is uh, the official language of Karnataka is Kannada. But Bangalore has only about 30% Kannada speakers. So it's a, always been a cosmopolitan city, partly because of its history, partly because of its climate, in the, what's in the air. Now again, because of its climate, some of the uh, first high technology industries were set up in Bangalore. So you had public sector investment in aircraft, in electronics, in heavy equipment, in machine tools, through the 50s and the 60s. So you had a strong techno technological base in Bangalore. Later on, you had, of course, the software boom. But the software boom built on these two aspects of Bangalore's history. Firstly, that it was a technology-driven center. In fact, in 1907, the first Indian Institute of Science, which is sort of like India's MIT, was set up here. Then you had these public sector industries in, in electronics and defense. So you had already uh, 
a skilled labor force attuned to modern technology. And we do have a swimming pool also. Our challenge is to attract and retain the best and the brightest. We want people to come and work for us and be part of the Infosys story. Our average age is about 26 and a half, 27, very young people just out of college with a lot of enthusiasm. So we not only have to create a great environment for them to work from a workplace point of view, we also have to make sure that they have other things here to look forward to. So we have great you know, cuisine, we have many restaurants all over the place, we have gym, we have a health club. We have sports facilities. The idea is to give a complete experience to young people. It's very easy to attract talent to come here, whether it's from the rest of India or even now increasingly from abroad. So once you have this talent pool and it, has, it, it attracts more talent, then you sort of create the positive spiral and then the companies come and then you create this cluster effect, which is what is happening here. Bangalore has is, is become has attained iconic status as a city of promise in India. Uh, I heard the other day in Uttar Pradesh, the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, Lucknow, the capital, there are Kannada classes which are popular because the local people, they think if they have to um, make their career in Bangalore, they would have to learn Kannada. So they're preparing to come to Bangalore. And there's a huge influx of uh, people. And that has affected the quality of life here, the kind of things that have come up, the shopping malls, the restaurants, the pubs. And another major change is this um, business process outsourcing because of this time zone difference, which happens most of the time in the night. So Bangalore has become in some parts a 24 hour city. Labor is cheap here. With the numbers that we've got, labor is cheap. So where you may be paying in the region of about seven or eight dollars an hour, our chaps are not getting that amount. It, uh, later on, of course, they, they, they may wake up, but at the money, at the moment, it's good money coming in uh, for the young chap. He's quite secure. The number of people in Bangalore has increased. The number of people traveling by rickshaws has increased, so the rickshaw drivers benefit. The number of taxis has increased. The number of businesses that have opened up the small shops, they have increased. I think everybody in general is benefited by, like there's more flow of money, so definitely everybody would be benefited. It's 18 months now since we started. And uh, from the day we started, I see an increase of uh, at least uh, 4 to 5 percent every month. And uh, keep one thing in mind, I have not advertised my showroom at all. From last two years, we can see that uh, a lot of changes in Bangalore. The uh, money circulation is open up and the market is open. And spending power is good in Bangalore now. On Fridays, we get around uh, 700. On th Saturdays, we get around 1,000 people. I've noticed this a couple of times. I just woke up in an elevator and, uh, of any, any building and you, you generally pitch in conversations or you, you, you overhear conversations happening between people and they'll be talking about some code problem or some some technical problem, I'm having a problem with the database so I'm having and there'll be two, two people talking about it, you'll be actually talking about it, you suddenly realize that it's gone, it's permeated so deep yeah. that everybody is, every next person beside you is connected with IT somehow. <laughs> When I finished my graduation, I had talked to university and so there was more chance for every college was waiting for me to get admitted there in their college and I chose this path. So there was major trauma and dilemma in the house and I couldn't convince anybody at that time. But three years after I moved here, 
it was very tough during those three years when I made the choice and came here. I couldn't go back home and have a conversation, decent conversation with anybody. Everybody probably, they just, I think they are generally interested in your uh, security in life in the future. And when they see that you're going in a path that is definitely more um, risky in terms of finance and if you're a dancer, then no husband is going to, no man is going to want you to be married to him and things like that. It's, a, it's an orthodox society that believes so. Um, it was tough. I guess I would like to do something involved with it. I've done a couple of plays myself. Um, I also like cartooning. And I like psychology, economics and sociology, which are very diverse, everything. So I guess I don't have one dream, but anything that would involve any of these things, I would enjoy doing. In India, most of the parents want their children also to have some cultural, some artistic experience. So everybody is encouraged to learn some instrument or to sing or to dance. The other day, a girl came here to buy an electric guitar. Some other came along with it. After seeing Yamaha guitar with me, she was quite thrilled. So my mother was quite happy. I said, okay, fine. But concentrate on your education. I don't mind giving you anything for you. But when it comes to choosing a career, a career path in art, in an art form, is not something that is encouraged here because it is believed and it is true that it doesn't give you money. And that is why I see that the, the mushrooming of call centers, etc., is a totally different kind of, uh, it, is, it is a distraction for youngsters who have the talent to do something extraordinary in an artistic field, but they, just for the money, they go sideways. And, and, and what is sorry uh, is, is to see most of these young students going to call centers to work. I think that is a problem. I feel they really lose out on a lot of things. They lose out on their lifestyle. They, they turn out to be artists and they end up being working in a call center. In fields like medicine and engineering, you have huge amounts of people going into these areas. And what happens is, unless you're in the top 10, say, you don't stand a very good chance of making a lot of money, even though you put in, say, five years of studying, which is why you see a lot of engineers going into call centers. And when, you, when they enter call centers, they hope that it would be just for like three years or something, where they could make enough money to sustain themselves and then later go back to engineering. But then once you start making easy money, you kind of don't go back. When we got out of college, the most difficult thing was getting a job. Getting a job, absolutely. Okay. For us, it was that was the first thing we had to do. And uh, if you get like 3,000, 4,000 rupees a month, that means like, like man, you're good. You're yeah. good, yeah. you know, yeah. you're really yeah. lucky. Getting, getting somewhere. And then now the guys just come out of college, even before you, you, you don't even have to think about a job, you know, you just walk into a call center, you well, study in a convent school, you know how to speak good English. That's it. Yeah, the job is there for you. The opportunity is tremendously growing in the call center industry and a person who gets out of college immediately earns about 10 to 12,000 or 9,000 rupees varying upon what kind of call center it is. Which is a very handsome and a decent financial package comparatively to other industries. When we start in the other industry, your financial package is about 3,000 to 4,000. But in a call center industry, you get paid about 9,000 rupees. And that is a huge amount for a youngster who's about 19, 21 years old. Let's work on the alphabet sounds. All right, give me, uh, we'll start with uh, this side. Rajesh, give me alphabet A. With the A. A sound. Apple. Lab. Apple. Bursa. sound. Bull. 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 Bull, right? Bull. Kura sound. Fatima. Vimla. Bursa sound. Doll. Nursing number thing. E sound. Elephant. Elephant. Okay. Right, so first session, let's practice our phoneme sounds. Let's see how we do it differently from the people in the US. Okay? Yes or no? Yes. Sir. All right. Ready? So we we'll start with the phoneme sounds of A to Z. Ready? Yes. All of you know the symbols? Yes. Sir. Okay, come on. Ready? One, two, three. Come on. Ah. Train them mentally and emotionally to understand the biological you know, working of their bodies in terms of having shifts. Because sometimes in call centers you have 40 shifts and 50 shifts in a day. So people are chosen at different, you know, uh, different timing slot, we call them time slot. Uh, and they come into work at 1 o'clock, 1 a.m. in the morning, at 5 a.m. in the morning, 
at 3.30 in the afternoon. So they get used to it mentally because they know that call center is a global market industry. And so they have to be prepared mentally and emotionally to work long hours in the night. When, when people initially join, they're not used to uh, uh, these times. So it is a little pressurizing initially when, when they have to work late nights in, in odd shifts. But uh, well, over a period of time, they, I guess they get used to it. What they do is, they, after the training is done, mm -hmm. they take a week's time to, they, they gradually get into the night shift. Mm -hmm. So they get, you know work a little late, mm -hmm. and then a little later, and a little later, so okay. that you know your body clock gets adjusted to the whole thing. Okay. Uh, because it's going to be very, very difficult if one fine day I ask you to sleep the whole day and work the whole night. It doesn't work that way. The shift is, I think, what time do you guys? They wind up at 11. So they come in by about, say, 2.30? 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock is when they're in. Allow that. So what you have to do is... We, we, when we train people, we train people to speak a standard American or a standard British accent. But um, communication is not just speaking, it's also listening. So you get them to understand the cultural diversities and dialectical differences across the US or across UK so that they are able to comprehend the person on the phone but yet speak in a standard British or a standard American so, uh, accent so that they can be understood by the other person, yet understand the other person and connect culturally. So we look at Alabama and find out what are the specifics of Alabama and get them to understand how to connect culturally when you get a person from Alabama on the phone. Even the accent kind of, you know, is so strong because you're working for eight or nine hours speaking to the US people. Then you go back home and you talk, start talking to your parents, it's no more that Indian son or daughter that they had, they have a different accent, they have a different viewpoint, they, they have wider thought processes. <laughs>
in five years, they are going to really regret wasting these five years. The change has come into the house and that's how, that's when you know that the change has happened, you know. You suddenly, uh, you suddenly see a lot of spending money, okay. You see a lot of things in the house, <laughs> okay. You suddenly see dad who's sitting there and, and looking at you and saying, how the hell did you buy that? When I have worked for 30 years and I was not able to buy that and you're buying that now. In this process, there are bound to be problems. Like the young people who really earn, you know, large sums of money doing jobs in software industry or whatever. I mean, they see things in one particular way. The older people see things in a different way. But a large amount of dating happens without parents' knowledge. So you would have people meeting at bus stands and going out and then coming back. Or they would park there like just think some, some person here had a boyfriend. She would get him to drop her somewhere there so that her parents wouldn't see him. So dating does happen among so many people. But, in, but I think 50% the parents are not aware of this at all. And I think this has been one of the costs of, uh, uh, of economic growth everywhere. That the relationship between generations has changed. And the reason for this is very simple. In a traditional society, the elderly are respected. The, in a pre-industrial society, the elderly are respected because the elderly are repositories of knowledge. You know, the old farmer is respected by the young farmer because the old farmer is 60 more years, that many more years of experience with climate and soils and so on. But in a society with rapid technological change, the elderly are not respected because the, the lawyer who's 55 or 60 is out of date. He doesn't know the new patent laws, for example, or the new technologies. He uses a typewriter. So technological change, when it's very quick, leads to a... Uh, disempowerment of the elderly because they're no longer res respected as the repositories of knowledge or tradition and that's happened worldwide and that's happening with dramatic effect in Bangalore for example I have known Bangalore for 40 years and it's I would never have thought even 20 years ago that there would now be so many old age homes in Bangalore because traditionally in India even in many parts of India still the majority of Indians expect to look after their parents when they go old and to keep them in their own home and uh, but now the elderly are being discarded or being uh, marginalized in the way they have been in many Western societies and this is a manifestation of this. So they are more focused, they are more independent, they want to do things even which normally their own predecessors for years would not have explored. Uh, they are uh, you know, very ambitious, they, are, uh, you know, they, are, uh, they, they want to uh, reach success quickly, they want to make money. Uh, they want to lead a much more Western lifestyle in terms of clothing, in terms of romance, in terms of uh, uh, you know any kind of uh, you know acquisition of product. They want to have a car early in their life. They want to own an apartment early in their life, and uh, it does have its challenges because you know they, their parents may have lived a much more sedate existence. Sometimes they become too arrogant because they think they are the know all. Second, because there is more money, they also tend to show off money, which is not very good. And third, particularly in an Indian context, where there's a fair amount of, uh, uh, you know, poverty around, you know, we are still economically not a very good country, okay? so that's reasonably poor country. So that sensitivity to fellow human beings, that the guy who will make in one month what you possibly make in one hour or maybe one shift or one half shift, should actually give you a feeling that look, I can do so much to my people around. That doesn't happen. I think it has introduced a certain restlessness and confusion. Among the people who have um, started earning more money, they don't know what to do with it. They, 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 have, they are losing a certain sense of balance and living it up rather unreasonably. And a large number, a ma the majority, haven't got what this small minority has got. So there are very stark, ugly differences. For example, now they say the good area to go is biotechnology or nanotechnology. And who get the opportunity to study these areas? People who have a lot of money to spend. These courses are very expensive. These postgraduate courses are very expensive. This education is limited to only privileged classes. So they go into this uh, area. And uh, naturally, the, the fact that the rich remain richer and the poor remain poorer continues to be so. No matter what comes, not new things comes. 
I mean, a man who is poor, obviously, he will not go into higher ed education or go into biotechnology or biochemistry or bioinformatics. Whatever new things comes is restricted to a certain people who have the privilege of going for it. No, I mean, it's only the money is getting to only the uh, like a certain class. And again, the certain class is like you know somebody who's like a upper middle class. Some um, they can uh, I mean they're good in English. They can talk in English, so they can go to this job. The reason why this industry has caught the imagination of the youngsters is that to enter this industry, all that you need is you should be good. You should have access to good education. Barring that, there's nothing that stops people. So you will actually find out you see, the total number of IT professionals across the country is about a million. Okay, about 30-40% is in Bangalore. Okay, out of this million, if you see, close to 60-70% of them actually have seen social mobility in their lifetime. Okay, so so you know that so what happens is many of them come from in fact our own janitors. Okay, the driver for Mr. Narayan Murthy. Okay, so you talk to their sons and daughters, for them, it's a paradigm shift. India should not depend exclusively on globalization and the benefits it can bring. There needs to be a lot of agrarian reform in the countryside, uh, attention paid on education and health so that the underprivileged can also advance their prospects. I think uh, within the industrial sector, uh, software generates very little employment, so I think there has to be a comparable surge in manufacturing where many more jobs can be created. So I'd say within the enclaves of uh, uh, outsourcing, there will be some trickle down, but uh, outsourcing globalization by itself can't solve the massive employment problem that India as a whole has. What do most of the people here do for a living? Um, agriculture. And many of them work, I guess, in the city. They go to the city and work, you know. But uh, it's, it's more often than not, it's women who work. And men, oh! men sit and uh, you know, drink. It gives them that. Uh, it takes them away from their daily drudgery, you know. And uh, these are cheap alcohol, cheap whiskeys, which gives them instant kick, mm -hmm. you know, as they as we call it. And uh, what else do they do? Bangalore is to Pradak Bedata, Mato, Bagdan Nekagali, Bekadas to Badavana Lakta, there was also building Lurta, General Lurta, Ella Adrasaha, Bangalore Hatre Dunam Yeno and Kulak Taila, Alin Yeno and Kulak Taila, Mate Alin Janapa is a little bit of Chara Martala, Ilian and Kulu Bek Nimge, Ankoledia, Yilvata, Dadun Dorilla, Mate Ali was Tegaliella, a near the West Terra, Navilin and Ella near Kotila Marta, our other Namian Kodakuna. ನೋಡ್ತಾ <laughs> Austerity and sacrifice, which were once values, greatly prized in Indian public life. So even our politicians and our industrialists live very simply. These va values are no longer prized, and there's a great deal of conspicuous hedonistic consumption. You know, uh, industrialists having, I mean, even ordinary middle class people driving large cars, uh, rich people having spectacular weddings in which millions of dollars are spent and all of that. So that's one side of the picture. But there's also a rather somewhat heartening side of the picture in which one could argue that Gandhi's values and ideals are not entirely uh, absent from contemporary India. Gandhi had the idea of a businessman as a trustee. 
He said the business, he, businessman is a trustee for society and must spend his wealth constructively for the regeneration of society. And one of the perhaps less noticed aspects of the software boom in Bangalore, in the city in which we talk, has been that some of the premier software capitalists are also, have also emerged as India's leading philanthropists. Two companies in particular, Wipro and Infosys. Uh, the promoters of these companies have started large foundations which have invested money in education, in health, in transportation. Uh, so I'd say there is an element of Gandhi there in, in these industrialists. Not in all industrialists, but not in all capitalists, but in some of the software billionaires, they've taken to heed Gandhi's advice that wealth has to be socially shared. I spend a lot of my time outside of Infosys actually focusing on civic and community issues. I, I head something called the Bangalore Agenda Task Force. It's a public-private partnership with the city, which is to come out with a, a plan, a vision, and an implementation of how to take the city forward. And we've done many, many things in the last four to five years, which have made a big difference to the city going forward. Nowadays, a lot of corporate houses are very interested in bringing uh, classical dance into their programs. And, and they are our main patrons, basically. Dance has lived in the past through the patronage by people who had the riches. And now I think it is happening through the corporate houses, which is a very good thing. Otherwise, no kind of art can uh, be sustained through generations and generations and can be improved or exp new experiments can happen if you don't, didn't, didn't have that patronage. Artists' minds should be focused on doing, creating, practicing and uh, not on how to earn the money. Many of these uh, multinational companies they have commitment towards the society. They have uh, commu uh, community programs. Many of the uh, companies have adopted schools, uh, and they are doing some work in their neighborhood. Each of many, of, most of the companies, they have some, and in that way, it has benefited. And uh, these industries are pushing the government to develop. They say our company is located here, but the road is very bad. You have to do something; otherwise, uh, you will not get business here. So, in a way, they are pushing the government. Uh, otherwise, the government by itself would not have acted so fast. It's definitely been a good thing because uh, Bangalore's opened up to the world on a larger scale because of outsourcing. Now, everybody knows where Bangalore is, and I think earlier people, uh, Westerners or foreigners generally, when they talked about India, they talked about uh, ascetic saints and snake charmers and rope tricks and forests and animals. For one, I think it is going to last for a long, long time. Again, uh, there are the naysayers who would say that it's basically, uh, it's basically based on price, competitive pricing and uh, sooner or later everybody's going to catch up. But I would say it's purely intellectual uh, capital. I mean, the brains here are some of the best in the world. All we needed were the, I guess, the opportunities to grow, the opportunities to bring out some quality work and that's what is happening and that's what is going to happen for quite some time, you know, for a long time. But with the bust that happened and a little after that, a lot of companies in India made sure that some of the American companies continue to run, irrespective of whether, whether they outsourced work or whether they even do it now, they have provided that cost effectiveness to the bottom lines of American companies. So we in effect are helping the companies grow even more than they actually would have. This issue has got uh, exacerbated because of the political situation as well as the fact that the recovery was by and large jobless. But the fact is that the US has become what it is today because it has focused on productivity because by improving productivity uh, they are able to raise the standard of living of their citizens. You know, that's, that's the real story. And any kind of protectionism against that actually hits, you know, just hits you back. It, it's just a, a reaction. And even if you listen to leading people like Alan Greenspan, they all believe that you should continue to do this. I personally believe that uh, outsourcing is a very small part of the overall equation. I think the US economy is very resilient. It creates millions of jobs every year. And I think if we continue with outsourcing, it helps the US because it helps in improving productivity, which in turn over time will help in improving the standard of living. And countries like India also will become more economically developed and create markets for US products and become part of the global, global economy. So I think it's a win-win. And I really wouldn't advise uh, you know, in any way uh, sort of uh, regulating it. You see, if uh, the rich and the poor are at that level, and after 10 years they go there, right, uh, then that's, that's, that should be acceptable. So long 
as the other parts of life, the social fabric, the environmental, uh, and, uh, you know, the natural environment are not degraded too. So I think uh, you can't expect a world with perfect equality. I think opportunities are growing in some parts of India as a result of outsourcing and that has to be welcomed. It will be quite an outlay for the country to bring the benefits of Western country to 1.2 billion, for instance, like hospitalization. Though we've got very good stuff, Pakistan bringing in their, their hard cases and all. But it's got to get lower down the road, see? It, that hasn't happened as yet. It'll take time. It'll take a lot of time. Mm -hmm.